Chapter 26 Weimar Double Decisions or Matter of Factness Unto Death Quoting Gustav Wangenheim, Die Mausefalle, 1931 Total onlooker You have been seen through totally And the year is 1932. The cards have been shuffled for the last game. For the insightful, it is clear that the horizon has already closed. The alternatives from now on will rear up in dull rage or helpless mind games. But events can no longer be averted. The year 1932 is a chaotic, inconceivably complicated one. It forms the last piece of the crisis complex of 1930-32, about which Ludwig Marcuse said rightly that it is more difficult to describe than an entire century would be. This year uses up three chancellors for after the cabinet of the centrist politician, Brunung, had collapsed in May. At that time, Goebbels wrote in his diary, 5th of May 1932, it's already beginning, it is really enjoyable, in the party we must now be absolutely quiet. We have to play at being disinterested. 13th of May 1932. The crisis goes on according to program. 30th of May 1932. The bomb has burst. At noon, Brüning handed over the dismissal of the entire cabinet to the Reich part president. The system is collapsing. These quotes from... Die Ungeliebte Republik, Dokumente zur Innen- und Außenpolitik Weimars, 1918-1933, Editors W. Michalka und G. Niedhardt, Munich, 1980, pages 327-28. In both the sub subsequent cabinets there are, to be sure, still no Nazis, but all the more quote-unquote disinterested and partyless politicians who in earnest already go about depoliticizing politics. Under Papen and Schleicher, the quote-unquote matter-of-fact ministers dominate, who have freed themselves from narrow party ties so as to better administer the interest of the whole. Of course, in close association with German nationals who represent in the governments, if not the interests of the whole, at least the whole of heavy industry. In 1932, the entire voting population is called to the ballot box three times, once in April to elect the president, and again in July and November for the Reichstag, which staggers on, unable to act, especially after the July elections made the Nazis into the strongest party. In the presidential election, the choices between Hindenburg and Hitler and the choice, of course, also, with the help of the still quote-unquote sensible Social Democrat votes, falls on the quote-unquote lesser evil that nine months later hands over the proclamation of appointment to the greater evil. The Prussian Sozialdemokratische Partei Deutschlands, SPD, Prime Minister Otto Braun wrote in Vorwärts, the party organ, on March of 10th, for the electors, there remains only one alternative, Hindenburg or Hitler. Can the choice be difficult? Look at both men. Hitler, this prototype of the political adventurer. Opposing him, Hindenburg, the embodiment of calm and constancy, of male loyalty and sacrificing dutifulness for the whole of the people, filled with a Kantian feeling of duty. I will vote for Hindenburg, and I appeal to the millions of voters, do the same, beat Hitler, Vote for Hindenburg. Brown's appeal is a masterpiece of late Weimar tactics. Double think, double role play, double decisions. One creates the false impression of having thought through the situation to the last detail and then votes with the entire pathos of apparent responsibility for the purportedly, quote unquote, lesser evil. No one has analysed social democratic ambiguity better than the social democrat Fritz Tarnow at the Leipzig SPD party conference in 1931. This quote from Dokumente zur Deutschen Geschichte, 1929-33, to 
editors W. Ruger and W. Schumann, Frankman, Frankfurt, 1977, page 39. Well, we stand indeed at capitalism's sickbed, not only as diagnostician, but also, now, what should I say, as a doctor who wants to cure, or as a joyful heir who cannot wait for the end, and most of all would like to help things along with a little poison. Our whole situation is expressed in this image. Tarnow describes precisely the unholy left alternative between tragic respectability and cynicism. By now we know these medical metaphors all too well. Had not Hitler repeatedly spoken of a political tuberculosis, from which the patient does not die immediately, but which progresses stealthily and uncannily, if the quote-unquote bitter fortune of the crisis does not bring the sickness to a head. Erich Musum, by contrast, had already referred to the double role of the doctor, who simultaneously operates on and exterminates the patient. Chapter 20. Now, because the crisis has surfaced in the most violent form, the double game becomes fully clear, even to the players. Tarnow goes on. We are condemned, it seems to me, to be the doctor who seriously wants to cure and nevertheless maintain the feeling that we are heirs who, as soon as possible, want to receive their entire estate of the capitalist system. This double role, doctor and heir, is a damned difficult task. We could save ourselves many a quarrel in the party if we were continually conscious of this double role. Sometimes some think that the needy situation of those who rely on the patient getting better demands than we do everything to heal the patient. Capitalism. Others think that now, when it is already grasping, is the right moment to give it the coup de grace. Tarnow now gives his vote. He pleads for the role of the doctor and advocates humanitarian, medically respectable tactics, rather than the cynicism of the air. In this quote from page 39. It is not so much the patient who arouses our sympathy, but the masses who stand behind it. When the patient gasps, the masses out there go hungry. If we know that, and know of a medicine, even if we are not convinced that it will cure the patient, but will at least ameliorate its rattling, so that the masses out there again get something to eat, then we will give the patient the medicine, and at that moment not think too much about the fact that we are heirs, and await the patient's impending end. These social democratic seesaw tacticians and double role players, however, entered with harsh rhetorics into the defensive alliance against fascism that was formed in 1932 under the dangerous sounding name Iron Front, and which was to bring together the SPD, the trade unions, the Reichsbanner, and some Republican groups. Already at that time, Ossietsky pronounced that only some sections deserved the epithet Iron whereas other sections were, quoting the same book, page 52, made of more pliable stuff, and some are no better than pancake batter. End quote. In 1932, the number of unemployed had risen to over 6 million, of which 3.8 million were in Prussia, and almost half a million in Berlin alone. The welfare officers had registered 7 million needy recipients for winter aid, the crisis had created the scenario in which the role of saviour was to be assigned to one among all the deceivers, strategists, double role players and gamblers with responsibility. Quoting Gustav Regler's Das Ohr des Malchus, Frankfurt 1975, pages 178 to 79 and 182, the Reich's capital was feverish. Every night corpses were delivered to the police. Sometimes they bore on their bloody coats the sign of the Republican flag. Sometimes the Communist Soviet star. Sometimes the swastika. Sometimes simply the number of the police state police. More often, however, they bore only the signs of despair on their faces. That light green. The colour given to them by the gas they had gulped. One must have seen the general misery so closely in order to fall prey all too easily to a revolutionary idea. All views were simplified to one sentence. It can't go on like this anymore. Every suicide who was carried out of his gas-filled flat, excuse me, gas-filled flat, 
seemed to raise himself a last time from the stretcher and point his finger at those standing about. Every suicide who was carried out of his gas-filled flat seemed to raise himself a last time from the stretcher and point his finger at those standing about. The great joint thinking now began to bear fruit. Those who had learned to quote-unquote think in terms of relationships, who had studied the great dialectic, had thought through Napoleon's example, and had practiced looking down from the general's hill, now found themselves in the position of the leaf that joins in the ecstasy of the will to power that drives the caterpillar to devour. Even one's own defeat then looks like mere tactics. Regler tells of a trade union functionary he met in mid-January 1933. Quoting page 189, Just let him come to power, this he said regarding Hitler, in eight months he will be bankrupt. End quote. Thinking. And then it's our turn. Similar models of thinking are firmly evidenced in the Communist Party. In July 1932, the chairman, Talman, Talman, is outraged when SPD functionaries ask KPD leaders whether they are at all serious about the anti-fascist United Front. Quoting Dokumente zur Deutschen Geschichte, page 65, Hitler's pack of officers and princes had declared that it wants to exterminate, hang, behead, and break the communist movement on the wheel, and in view of this fact, in view of the danger that Germany could become a land of gallows and pyres, we communists are deemed to be not in earnest about the anti-fascist, the proletarian united front. End quote. And nevertheless, the question is correctly posed, and the answer is not free of hypocrisy. For the questioner, as well as the respondent, have for a long time been speaking the language of doublethink, and know all too well that every politician, in addition to what he says, calculates on a second level. For many communists, the United Front was a respectable fiction. They themselves, with a second cynical look, easily saw through. Even its protagonists did not really, quote-unquote, believe in it. According to Karl August Wittfogel's report, in the autumn of 1932, a scene was played out in Berlin in which the spirit of strategic cynicism is thrown more luridly into relief than in any satire, no matter how biting. It contains the essence of the whole age, the escalation of strategy into the diabolical, the crystallization of doublethink into perfect cynicism, the everlasting being in the right of the simultaneously iron and nimble tactician in a reality where things always happen differently from how the grand t- t- tactician thought. Quote, after Matthias Griffrath, Wasserseichen der Despotie, ein Portrait von Karl August Wittvogel in Transatlantic, February 1981, page 37. It was a 7th November celebration in the embassy on Unter den Linden, one of those gala celebrations with caviar and vodka and all that. I stood around with Gross. Piscator, Brecht. I no longer know if it was them, but anyway, that sort. Suddenly someone came and said, Radek is here. I left the others and looked for Radek, asked him, we knew each other from Malik, do you know what is happening here in Germany? What? If things go on like this, Hitler will come to power and everything will go under. Yes, but you have to understand that. That has to come. The German workers will take on two years of Hitler. End quote. This says, in effect, besides the surface propaganda in favour of anti-fascism, the United Front, etc., Moscow had already thought out a second line that allowed the super tactician, Radek, to bet on Hitler just like someone bets on a catastrophe. Thus one could fight against him, and nonetheless still find something good in his probable victory. That, as it was thought, he was specially suitable to bring about the total bankruptcy of the system. This form of double strategy gives the communists' rhetoric of crisis in 1932 an inflammatory tone. For the worse things get for the quote-unquote system, 
the better it is for those who want to see its end. In the communists' diagnoses, a positivistic, grand tactical spirit is mixed with malicious joy and open, catastrophial gratification. Thus, the Rote Fahne wrote on January 1st, 1932, again a quote from Documenta zur Deutschen Geschichte, pages 49 to 50, Storm Year 1932. The capitalist world takes leave of the year 1931 with an annihilating declaration of bankruptcy. With the report of the Special Advisory Committee of the Bank for International Reparation Payments that has investigated German, Germany's economy and financial position. There is no document from a capitalist pen that, with such unconcealed pessimism, ascertains the downfall of capitalism and outlines, it, outlines its contradictions and its manifestations of putrefaction with such sombre colours. The financial bankruptcy of Germany, however, will rebound on the creditor countries and conjure up new worldwide catastrophes. But the imperialist bandits who see a way out of the crisis in a new world carnage forget that, with the fury of war, they simultaneously unleash the powers of the revolution. Here, a masochistic form of thinking has transformed itself into a strategic consciousness. This the leaves feverishly approach the caterpillar in the expectation that they will win something of the caterpillar ego if they only let themselves be devoured patiently enough. What are then, quote unquote, two years of Hitler if afterwards we get our turn? What Rathenau had described as a soothsayer in 1912, tactics, diplomacy, deception, down to the shopkeeper, had been realised here on a large scale. In the middle of the crisis, the strategist carousel turns all the more quickly. Every rider outlines from his or her carousel horse a grand view, and from this develops tactics for getting the whole. Social democracy grasps the total scene as one in which it is condemned to play the double role of the doctor and the willing heir at the sickbed of capitalism. The communists interpret the situation as the agony of capitalism, whose death can only be a question of time, so that the collapse will be accelerated by those who, on the one hand, fight against the fascist healing sorcery, and at the same time, however, bank on the eventuality that fascism will inject the dose of poison into capitalism that puts the system out of its misery, leaving the communist party as the happy heir. One side wants to ameliorate the crisis, and the other wants to push it to the revolutionary extreme. Both draw up their account not only without the innkeeper, but also without his parasites. For on the opposing side, the fascists and the bourgeoisie, too, the tool and its user, lead each other astray. On the one hand, large sections of German economic leadership swing around to the Nazi line because they believe that one has to go along with the Hitler course in order to be able to hold on to the course of industry and that of the quote-unquote general interest or quote-unquote taming tactics. Hitler, for his part, knows he has to make the industrialists believe that in him they have found the tool that will realise their political goals. Only if they believe that can he, in turn, make them into tools of his global vision and melt down the economy into his block and his frequently conjured hard as steel body of the people, which will climb out of the trenches and the graves of the First World War so as to finally roll over the quickly subdued land as radiant victor. Then Hitler's period as dissimulator would also have an end. Then he would finally be able to be completely as he felt himself to be, the chosen one of the prophecy, the emissary of the dead, the double and the spirit of revenge. He, the quote-unquote adventurer, quoting Brown, the drummer, the charlatan, who was certified by everyone as historical and histrionic, proved himself on the carousel of tacticians and semi-realists to be the only full realist. That is, the only one who knew how to pursue their aims, not only as politician, but also as psychologist and dramatist. He not only practiced the art of deception, but also 
saw the necessity of enticing those who were prepared to be deceived with a show of seriousness and idealism. He knew how to handle the collective will to illusion by creating the backdrops before which the people could let themselves be deceived to their heart's desire. The illusion into which the one who is ready to be deceived thinks of falling will serve the defrauded one simultaneously as an excuse and, in the end, as an explanation why everything had to happen as it did.